just a little introduction why we love containerization. So containerization is a very nice um, lightweight way to run applications in some isolated environment where we don't, um, which allows us to manage our applications better on, on large scale and also control the environment as a user who runs task our, where our workloads are running. Since um, containerization, it abstracts away the system where our tasks are running and um, this helps both um, the operators and um, the user of the containerized application. We can isolate resources like um, physical resources like um, CPU, disk, network, um, visibility of, of the system. We are containerizing all the outside system and that clearly defines some um, application surface in the end, which makes it relevant to the enterprise since um, in that context we are interested in, in managing um, that surface. So, um, but of course all this is not um, as easy as it sounds since um, containers are just very lightweight um, wrapped uh, lightly web wrapped processes, there is com potentially some crosstalk between the container and the host system since they both share the same kernel. And um, Jay will explain uh, to us how, how SecCom can be used to minimize um, crosstalk or at least control it. Um, um, we might um, require running um, processes in some, um, uh, we, we might require processes to run with privileged access inside the container while we would not like the user starting that container to run um, with a privileged account on the host system. And um, Trini will tell us about that when he talks about user namespaces later. Or we might have a container which we don't want to isolate that much from the host system since we would, have to, would like to have privileged access to, to host facilities. And I will talk about capabilities to explain that a little better. And, um, the goal of these three new features of the Mesos Container Rider are to, in the end, improve isolation and to reduce the um, surface area for attack and um, also allow processes to run with less privileges than, uh, with, with as little processes and privileges as possible. So let me briefly talk about capabilities. So capabilities are some mechanism under POSIX and also extended under Linux to um, divide um, the privileges that the root user has into more fine-grained capabilities, as they call them. And um, for examples might be that a process binds to some privileged port or that we send um, signals like kill to some process which we didn't initiate, where we run or read files where we don't have the permissions to do that and many more. And this is all these things root can do, but of course you would not want your container to run as root ideally. And um, so the purpose of, of introducing capabilities is to better control privileged access to the system since um, running with super user privileges is um, just um, too much and um, to also um, shield operate, uh, the systems and users from making errors which could have effects beyond the containerized environment, since none of that really fits our expectation for containerization very well. So as a, so as a motivating example, these are, this is some applications for phones which um, provide a flashlight. And the one on the left-hand side uh, needs, uh, requires basically the maximal capabilities and the one on the, so this is some advertisement, that's why it says the competitors, com competitors and ours. And the right hand side requires access to take pictures and videos basically, which is controlling the camera where the flash sits. So we are, at least I would be much more comfortable to run the application on the right than the one on the left which wants to make phone calls, for example. I don't know why my, my flashlight needs to make phone calls. So this kind of maps what we want to um, expose in, in Mesos. So this is a list of capabilities currently supported in Mesos. So there's a large list of capabilities and it keeps growing in, in a Linux for each new kernel version. And this is the list we currently expose. And there's, for example, here NetBind service, 
which allows a process to bind to arbitrary ports of their skill up there, which is the capability to send arbitrary signals to other processes of DAC override and DAC research, which are related to, to file permission checks. And there are more, for example, setting nice levels, setting the system time. Um, so one big um, capability is your sysadmin, which is like a blanket bag, which keeps um, being like reshaped and getting smaller and like more defined, basically. There's also NetRAW, which we'll use later in some example, which um, is related to making raw, to, to have, having raw access to some socket. So this is some, some protobuf message that, that we added to Mesos. And um, we also added some isolator, which we call the Linux capabilities isolator. And um, the idea here is that the operator sets up some agent with a set of allowed capabilities. Capabilities the operator is comfortable to give um, to, to users. And the user requests some capabilities required for their tasks in some message. And um, in the end, this is like some, the, Agent capabilities are always the, some, some limiting set for what capabilities a task can request, and then the processes running inside that task are further restricted by the task. And that gives us that nice containerization and defined um, service area. So in some future extensions we are thinking about, so currently non-root tasks, the tasks not running as root, they can effectively only use file-based or libcap-based capabilities and they, for example, lose all their capabilities if they fork. And Linux larger than 4.3 introduces some ambient, introduces ambient capabilities to, to address this issue. And we could, we are thinking about adding support for um, this kind of um, Feature to Mesos, for example, we could expose ambient capabilities or we could use, a, use user namespaces that Srini will tell us about. So what have we now? We have new abstractions to actually talk about capabilities on the agent and task level. We have some interface interfaces for operators to grant capabilities to tasks and for users to request capabilities. And so we have a new tool to um, work with privileged tasks. And We'll hear from Jay next. Okay, thanks. Uh, first of all, I wonder how many of you have ever heard about SETCOM? Please raise your hand. Great, right, I see quite a few. So I'm gonna give a brief introduction of SETCOM itself. So what is SETCOM? So the full name is Secure Computing Mode. So you can see it's introduced to kernel since uh, 2.6.12 and is to put your process or application into a real secure way to ask you. So basically the first, very first version of SETCOM only support four sys calls, which is uh, rewrite, uh, sick return, and exit. So exactly, you need to open the file necessary before you put them into SETCOM mode, and you do put, and you uh, start the SETCOM, in, load that into the kernel, and you start execution. And in this very limited way, to secure your app or your process, and uh, so basically, the mechanism restricts the calls a process can make through the kernel. And since the kernel 3.5, uh, SICOM 2, version 2 is introduced, basically it's called filter mode. So you can install actually a filter, a custom, custom filter, and uh, to, to limit your sys calls. So it's not only that for sys calls anymore. And uh, I want to emphasize that it's a one-way transition. So you can put your process into second mode, but you can never withdraw it without ex exiting the process. The reason behind that is so, you know, malicious hacker may, you, you, there's no way you want to allow a hacker to withdraw the profile or the, uh, withdraw the filter and do malicious hacking on your uh, kernel. So that's always one way transition. You're in, you're never out. And, uh, so next one is why do we need SETCOM? So as you see, it's a filter. It's a syscall filter you put into the kernel. So it's, of course, it's to reduce the text surface of the kernel. And uh, because, as Benjamin has mentioned before, your container shared the kernel with the host, and of course, with other containers running on the same host. So you really want to limit the capabilities. You want to limit the text surface of the kernel. It's not virtual machine. If your virtual machine is compromised, you still got your hypervisor, 
and the hypervisor is compromised, then you reach the hot kernel. But in containerizing, con containerization is never there. And uh, so with Sycom Enable, you can execute the customer's code with more confidence. And uh, you know that there are certain such calls you're never allowed to make. So for example, you have a zero day attack, and uh, you know a certain such call is compromised, and uh, it's, a uh, hacker can use that explore your kernel. So the simplest way, without patching your kernel, the simplest way is to, to disable that syscall. And uh, so how does Zcom work? Uh, I probably already mentioned a little bit. It's uh, essentially a Berkeley packet filter. It's a program that you load it into the kernel, and after that point in time, every syscall you make will go through the filter first. And will go through all the rules in that filter, and until it hits a clear red light or green light. So for example, if you disable nano sleep, then you make, you just in the batch type sleep, then it will say, uh, and you put the action to it as kill, then your process will get killed immediately. And so there are a couple of act uh, actions uh, available, uh, kill, allow, error, trap, and trace. So most common use cases are kill, allow, and error. So basically, if a, a syscall, you put that in kill, then your process could kill. And of course, allow is the green light. And the error is, yes, you can make the syscall, and uh, your process won't be killed, but I will always return an error. And uh, I need to mention that there's a performance penalty uh, introduced by the so second filter, because there's an overhead. Every syscall needs to go through the filter, and uh, so if it's a huge, complex filter, you want to put your uh, like most common sys calls as first as possible, like, so that it will hit the uh, certain rule as quick as possible. So uh, who's using it? Uh, SecCom is introduced to kernel to uh, restrict your process, and uh, uh, we have OpenSSH using it. We have ESFTP and LXD, as some of them might know, is a, uh, uh, another containerization technology, actually probably the very early one. And uh, Chrome is using it to sandbox the, uh, for, for example, Flash player. And uh, Docker, okay, Docker supports it. And Docker supports it by default, starting from 1.10. So probably you uh, instantly you Docker run a container, actually second rule is installed. And, uh, the, Profile, so I think the filter is a very modest protection of your kernel. For example, some of the, some of the calls are disabled, for example, unshare. So if you do docker run busybox unshare dash dash PID, it won't work. So it will, your process will get killed. And uh, we encourage you to do that with Mesos as well. It's like put the default protection on your agent or your host. But we are still in the design, no, we're just uh, still hesitating to put that into default mode because it might break, uh, cause some backward compatibility issue, may break your uh, previous applications, but we encourage you to do that. So when it comes to Mesos, we add isolator, which is Linux class seccom, and so you can use dash dash seccom profile to uh, enforce your own uh, filter, and of course you can grab the one from Docker, and if ever OCI is going to introduce a spec for seccom, we're gonna support it, and uh, you can come up with your own, either more strict or uh, more customized second profile. And uh, to, to name that, this is, we have two level of protection. One is protect your agent against the user. Another one is to protect your executor against the task. So apparently the former one is enforced by the operator of the cluster, and the later one is enforced by the framework, so basically the users. So why? As Probably the very similar reason to Benjamin has mentioned before uh, for list capability. We have, want to have this extra protection enforced by the user. And uh, yes, we are using libsecomp. So if you want to use this feature, you need to have to install libsecomp. Uh, it's open source under LGPL license. And so you can uh, install that prehand and you compile Mesos with dash dash enables dash secomp. And uh, I'm gonna let Srini to talk about user namespaces, and uh, later on we'll give a demo of all the features. Hi everyone. Um, so Linux namespaces have been there for, for a while now, but uh, 
This is the species has been added recently, uh, as new as uh, 2013. And uh, it's taking some traction. Um, first it released in 3.8 kernel uh, version. Um, the need for sorry, the need for uh, user namespaces is uh, because, uh, like any other namespace, it provides isolation of the users. Um, so far, we have been running the containers as uh, privileged mode. Um, a root process is not good. It can do damage to your host system. Uh, so, um, user namespaces when introduced, it will allow you to virtualize the users and um, so that the users inside the namespaces are isolated, just like uh, the, as an example, is the feed namespace. The process tree inside the feed namespace is different from the process tree outside the feed namespace. Processes have no clue of the, the, the pits outside the namespace. Same way the users running inside the user namespace have no idea about the users outside the namespace. And it is useful to run uh, processes with different uh, uh, users outside and inside the namespace. And we'll see how. Um, like I sp said before, um, user namespaces are us useful for running containers in privileged mode. That means the container is running as a root inside, but it is not a root from outside. Uh, this is done by mapping the unprivileged user outside of the user namespace, which is your host, probably. Um, but inside the container, uh, inside the user namespace, the container has UID 0 and GID 0, which will help you to, in to do um, things that a normal root user can do like installing software, etc. At the same time, it will protect your global resources. The containers running inside the user namespace will not have access to certain things. So, uh, outside, but it has root privileges inside. But when a container is launched, it obtains the capabilities from its parent it will have all the capabilities inside the user namespace, but it will not have any use capabilities in the parent. And the capabilities that you will not have global capabilities for, such as CAPSIS time, you cannot change the system time, or you cannot add devices or lower some kernel modules. That, that, that's the kind of the protection you get from user namespaces. User namespaces are uh, useful uh, when you map the users from inside the namespace. For example, the user inside the container could be root in two different containers. For example, container A has user UID 0, which could be mapped to UID 500 on the outside, on the host. Similarly, container B, which is running as root, uh, may be mapped to a UID 800 on the host. So the, the, uh, the process runs running inside the uh, user namespace will have no idea what their privileges outside. Um, this is accomplished by using GID and UID maps. These map files exist under slash proc bit of your container process, uh, UID map and GID map files. Uh, there is also a concept of sub-UID and sub-GID map files. This is introduced um, as, along with the user namespaces in kernel 3.9. Uh, this functionality allows you, when you add user on your Linux host, it will create a range of IDs, and it will write that IDs into the sub-UID and sub-GID. GID is the group ID, or the user ID files. Um, these ranges can be used by these users to map into their containers. Docker today uses the sub-UID ranges, so that means what Docker does is, if, you're, if you enable user namespaces today, it will create a repo of, uh, with that user ID and writes the image layers in, into that repo. So that means uh, you're running um, a separate repo for, for the Docker. As I explained, the, the user mapping is written into UID map and GID map files. 
And as you can see in the picture above, that root zero in first container is ma mapped to Ubuntu, U UID 1000, on the host, and the second container running as root is mapped to unprivileged user. Uh, what it means to Mesos, Mesos currently runs tasks in two modes. The tasks are run as privileged task or unprivileged task. A privileged task is run as a root, and so the root inside the container is nothing but the root outside the container. In, in, for unprivileged tasks, you launch the task as a non-privileged user, as a non-root user. That means, uh, by default, in Mesos, there is a flag called switch user, which is set to true, and the task runs as that non-root user. It does not have much capabilities when you are running the task. It cannot do a lot of things that a privileged container can do. So, user namespaces are important. We need to enable user namespaces. There are two, uh, there are a few things that you need to do to enable user namespaces. One is, we need to add a new agent flag, add an isolator. Most of the work, uh, isolation is done through isolator concept in Mesos. Um, there are isolators for pretty much everything you know, like C groups or, or SecComp, uh, you heard. Um, similarly, there will be an isolator for user namespaces. And then we also have to manage the user mappings for each of the users that the containers are running inside. Uh, agent flag, um, if you are running as an unprivileged user, uh, you will add an agent flag, isolation equal to namespaces slash user. That will, enable, that will tell the agent that when the task is launched as a non-root user, the task will enter the user namespace and run inside the user namespace. And the task is normally started by an unprivileged user as shown in the last line here. Because if you are running as a root user, there is no point in mapping a root inside the container to a root outside the container. That means you are still running as a privileged container and you have full access to the root. So, isolator is, uh, it, for the user namespaces, is just a marker which tells the agent that this process is going to run as uh, inside a user namespace. Uh, most of the work is done by the executor. Executor, when it knows that it is launched as a non-root user, it will make the task enter into the user namespace by joining the user namespace. And then, once the process joins the user namespace, the executor will go ahead and write the UID and GID map files that will map the user as root inside the container. Suppose you are running Ubuntu user, the Ubuntu user on the host gets mapped to a root inside the container. This is all done by the executor for you. Uh, there are problems with user, uh, user namespaces. That is the reason why um, it hasn't taken much of uh, um, traction yet. It, even in Docker, Docker the way they do is, like I explained, they have to have a separate repo for each of the users. You can run launch the Docker, um, Docker daemon with one user uh, for, for enabling the user namespace, and uh, all the images that you download will be CH modded to that user. This is one of the problems. It's hard to share the root file system between different users um, because the file systems do not have these capabilities. The second problem we have with user namespaces is mounting mount system column by default is denied inside the user namespace. Only files, uh, file systems that are marked FS user NS mount are allowed to be mounted in the user namespace. Um, and there is no real um, way to tell the user in, inside the user namespace to the user outside the user namespace. But there is some work done in this area. Uh, Fuse file system right now allows you to manage the mount uh, for the user that is running inside the user namespace. And there is a patch that is currently in process on kernel side, uh, which will allow you 
to shift the file, uh, UIDs and GIDs from inside the SNS space to outside the SNS space. That's uh, through the virtual file system EFS patch that's uh, um, currently, hopefully will be merged at some point that we can leverage and then we will uh, will not have that restriction on mounting the file systems inside the user space anymore. Um, so uh, that's pretty much about the user space, uh, but uh, I want to give you a brief update about where we are with all the three features that we talked today. Uh, after that, we will uh, have brief demos on all the three features. Uh, first, about the user space, the patches are are there. Uh, the preliminary functionality is tested. Uh, we think um, uh, the review will happen soon and then uh, we still have problems to solve about the file systems. Capabilities code is already in, in the mainstream, so please use it and enjoy. Uh, Secomp is also the same, it's, uh, the several patches are for review right now. So all in all, SecCom capabilities and user spaces to work together will improve your container security. And by, by adding all these three together, you're restricting what your container can do um, and uh, minimizing the surface area of attack for your container. It's demo time and I'll uh, hand it over to Ben. So I'll show you a quick demo on capabilities. So just to orient you, up here, I, have, I will increase the font size. Up here is the master running as non-root. Down here I have some agent node running as root. And over here I will start some task as um, non-root. Okay, let me first show you. Oops. Let me just restart the agent here. Yeah, yeah, so that I make it nice. No, not yet. Bigger, bigger, bigger. Okay, so I'm, this is like some very, this is some, some released version of Mesos. So I'm using sudo, starting agent, talking to some master I have running, some work directory launched here because I'm not installing that and I'm allowing, so here I have a flag allowed capabilities and then behind the JSON, so you see here some empty brackets, so I allow not nothing, okay? And I specify isolation with Linux capabilities isolator. So let's start that and now it's talking back to the master, which is nice. And um, so the task I want to run here, Oops. So I want to run ping. So you see here that ping uses libcap, which is a library to work with capabilities. So it uses libcap to actually request the net raw capability, which I can request as a user. And that is used to then send packets, um, uh, packets to uh, some host. And um, the command I want to run is run ping with one packet localhost. Okay, and you see that works if I'm not in a container. So now we have, let's use Mesos execute to run that. And um, so I'm using Mesos execute talking to master. My command, you see my command here, I give it some name, my task, or my framework, and I request net raw capabilities. So just remember the agent had allowed capabilities was empty. So if I run that, I expect that to fail. And it does fail. So I get told that down here, failed to launch container capabilities requested in that raw, but only nothing are allowed. So this is good. So what happens then if a user is not interested in declaring that he wants to use net raw? So what do I expect for this here? So this executable will use libcap to get net raw capabilities. So I also expect this to fail. And if I execute that, it failed. It fa ah, it failed. Oh, I'm so happy. <laughs> so this failed. Let me show you the log. Um, 
som So let's just look at the standard error since it failed. And this says um, that ping couldn't open that socket since the operation is not permitted. So that makes me happy because this um, Mrs. Execute can just do what the operator allowed. Okay. So next we'll see something from Jay on SecCom. So first of all, I want to show you, this is the default SecCom profile from Docker. And uh, they, it looks like they are doing a whitelist approach. So you see the default action is error. So you're allowing these syscalls, anything other than that will be disabled and will be returning error. And uh, in a, yes, you can see it. So I'm starting a master here, it's very normal as uh, you started. And here say, I want to first show you Docker one, actually. So if I run Docker, this is probably I would need to show you Docker uh, version. It's uh, 1.11, it's very old. And uh, if I run this command, Docker run, and it's a busy box, it's on share, dash SP ID. So unshare is not allowed in the default profile. I'm not doing anything special here. So you'll see it's permission not permitted. So that's actually how Docker enforces a default profile. And if you want to do the same thing in Mesos, uh, you first create a uh, default JSON file specifying your rules. So I happen to have this one at the hand. Uh, it's very simple. The uh, default action is to allow. And I'm going to kill any process that calling nano sleep. So basically that's the uh, command sleep using. So what I'm expecting, I'm starting the agent using this uh, isolation equals to link second, and I'm using the profile I just created to disable the sleep call. So I'm starting the agent, and uh, I'm going to execute this command. So the command is sleep for one second. So normally it will, of course, work, but with second enable, it will get task failed. And uh, I, if you look at the log, it will say a bad syscall. That's what happened when you use SecComp. So for example, if you, the other day, uh, sleep, nano sleep call suddenly become a uh, compromised syscall, people can exploit kernel using that syscall, you can simply disable it using SecComp. Okay, I'm gonna hand over to Sri. Three demos in a row. Hopefully mine works. Do you guys see the screen? Yeah. Um, at this point, I'm going to start the agent. If you, as you can see here, my isolation is set to namespaces slash user. So that means I have user namespaces uh, enabled. I will start both master and slave uh, over here, and then. Then uh, let's first launch this as a root user. We know we are running as root and there's no point in user namespaces actually. And if you can go and see, um, I, I just have a sleep command there and the sleep is running as root. So basically nothing much happens here. Uh, in this particular command, there are two things I'm doing. I'm printing the ID, and I'm sleeping for some time so that I can know what user I'm running. And I will also look at the map file that this process that is running has written. And then I also touch a couple files so that I know that I am doing uh, something with the file system. So bear with me for a second. Um, 
So I touch two files as root, so they are returned as root. Let's clear up those two files for a second, bear with me. So then the other thing I want to show you is, if you go and look at the logs, ah, okay, uh, in, I did not write the logs. Um, let's go and start as user, unprivileged user, that's more important. Essentially, um, as an unprivileged user, my ID is 1002. So that means I am launching the task as this 1002. And if I want to do a touch on ETC, permission denied, I don't have access as this user to that volume, uh, that ETC area. So now I'm launching the same task, right? I'm in Mesos, uh, I want to print the ID and I want to sleep for 10 minutes, uh, 10 seconds, and see the UID map, and then touch those two files and see what happens. Um, as you can see, it is sleeping there, and if I see the sleep, sleep is run as unprivileged user. That, is, uh, that means the task is running as unprivileged user. Only thing I need to know is if it is in the username space or not, um, if you see this task has exited and if we go and see the logs of this task you can see the ID I printed it printed as UID 0, GID 0 this task is run as root inside the container but it is not root outside the container. So the task itself, and you can also see the map file here. The mapping has been done this way uh, right now. One to one mapping for the first 1001 users. My UID is 1002. So that is mapped to root inside the container. So for one entry, the root zero is mapped to 1002 which is my unprivileged user ID. And the rest of these IDs are mapped one to one thereafter. I randomly choose 64K. Um, so the other thing important to notice here is, if you look at touch files, it touched one file where it is allowed, slash etc UNS touch test. And that touch file, when it touched, it touched it on the host as unprivileged user. So its privileges are as unprivileged user. The task itself failed because, you know, it does not have permission to slash etc where it is, it tried touching a file. So that means that it worked as expected. So with that, my demo, uh, that's pretty much it about my demo. If you have any questions, we would like to... No questions? Thank you very much for your time.